comes the girl who just last week was stung by a nasty old sea nettle. Stepping out of her glass booth here at Radio Central. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Something's wrong. No, nothing's wrong. Yeah, but every time for the last six months I've been saying stepping out of her glass booth at Radio Central and you come in and you fall down over the microphone cable. I just mastered my clumsiness now. You came in like Cinderella. You just trippy-toed right in the room and, and beautifully. I mean, I've been uh, taking lessons. Phyllis Ding Dong, huh? Yes. That's marvelous. You you really look great. I, I, I was surprised. You have Thank a beautiful you. dress on. And Thank you. And your hair is combed. And yeah. I noticed you got your ear lowered there. That's right. All right. It looks mm -hmm. very nice. I even them up, yeah. It, it really does look good. Uh, I'm I can't believe it. Well. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry. We have ladies and gentlemen. Gee, I'm proud. Here she is, Washington's own weather girl, looking spiffy as always, Miss Janitor with the Temperatures. Pimlico, 360, 240, I knew it could 130. Knew it was. Hialeah, 370, uh, 275, why does she 145. I can't believe it. Laurel, 280, 220, and $3. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, you came in here so nice and you didn't trip. I thought maybe today you'd give us a break and give us the tip. Why are you? You know it's illegal to give race results over the air on this station. I'm we don't not do reading it. race results. Well, you sit there and you say, Hi, Aaliyah, 340, Pimlico, 580. You're giving That's track? the price of admission to the various grandstands in the track. I guess uh, oh. I fooled you to oh. my smarty pants. Man. Well, I, gosh, gosh, I'm sorry, Miss Janitor. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even... That's yeah. wonderful. I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Where are you going? Well, I guess you don't need me anymore. You, you're doing it yourself so well. I just, I'll just leave. Okay. Bye. <laughs> oh, clumsy! I don't believe. That's a Jonah Jones quartet, and it's called. Uh, Blue Lou, that's what it is. How do you do, Blue Lou? I'm WRC. It's 24 minutes after 4 o'clock in the Walker Scott Show. Ladies and gentlemen, the place right here, I guess. <coughs> I see Hi. now that it is time. Good afternoon. Arthur, Hello. excuse me just a moment, sir. Arthur. Yeah, what? Would you knock the music off, please? All right, let me take the needle off. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Be well, easy. you said knock it off. You Be didn't say anything about fading it out. I... Well, that record wasn't ready for the Smithsonian quite yet, but I think now it is. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a new announcer here, WRC, and your <laughs> name is? Less Humid. What's your name again? Less Humid. Less Humid is your name? That's right. And where did you come to us from? Uh, I was a uh, five and ten cent store. No, no, I don't mean where were you last. I mean, where did you work last? That's where I worked last. I did PA announcements at Murphy's, you know. And you're our new announcer? Good afternoon, ladies, in the lingerie department. No, 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 no wait. I, I think hey. we got the point by now. You are going to do a commercial for us now, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Less Humid, our new... What's the matter? Oh, uh, a little water here. <laughs> sure, we got some water. Well, what's the matter? Huh? A little nervous. Here, help yourself. What, are you Hi. nervous? Uh, a little nervous. I thought you were a real pro from that. Huh? Yeah. I... I'm all right now. Okay, very good. Hand me the script. Yeah, here's the script. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Shadies and Lennelman. No. Uh, uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. No, wait. I, the ladies. music is making him nervous, uh, are there? Oh, don't, okay. don't play the music. Take, take the music out. Just take it out. Not, not like the way you did the last time. Excuse me. Oh. Just... Uh, where was I? Oh. Right, ladies and gentlemen, once you take your family to the Harder Chouse. No, it's the no, Charter House. Once you house. take your family no, to no, the no, no. Take Harder your Chouse. Take You're really... your family to the Charter House, ro Robe Room, rim, Rib Room. Rib Room. You're very ro nervous. Room, and try yeah. their Boast Reef. A roast no, beef. their Boast Roof. Yeah, well, look. Reef's by. I get you. A Boast Roof. Yeah, well, take <laughs> uh, Arthur, you better play to me. He fainted. Oh, oh. Oh. Get him out of here. We'd like to murder you. I, what the man was trying to tell you was the Charter House over on U.S. Route 350, which, of course, is the Shirley Highways. It's not the Shirley Highway. I, we better revive and let him do it. <laughs> you think you can take over here? <laughs> uh, uh, actually, what we're trying to say is that if you want we a good roast beef dinner, what we're trying why to we say. suggest that you go to the Charter House, a wonderful place there. The Charter House has some wonderful roast beef out there. In the Rib Room restaurant, they start serving dinner at 5 p.m. And just uh, let me tell you what you get there in a typical dinner. Roast beef, uh, Idaho baked potato. And along with that, you get the Charter, Hole, uh, Charter House <laughs> salad bowl, Stratford. That's right, on it. Go ahead. The point is, 
But you must, there's one prerequisite before you go to the charter house, you must have a Hertz truck with you. <laughs> because you are really going to be so full by the time you leave that you're going to have trouble getting out of there. And besides, you won't be able to eat all the roast beef they serve you. You'll have to have the Hertz truck to carry what's left off oh. your plate home. Actually, I've never eaten so much roast beef in my life for the price they charge. I'll tell you how to get to the charter house. You just go out Shirley Highway to Route 350, and uh, it's just about 10 minutes out of Washington, and you'll be seated there ordering your dinner. It's a wonderful place. And uh, you'll have a wonderful time out there. When you get out on the Shirley Highway, turn right at Edsel Road Edsel crossover. Road, right, crossover at Edsel Road, turn right. And there you are, very shortly thereafter, at the Rib Room at the Charter House. And it's a wonderful place. It's only ten minutes from downtown Washington. Oh, take me to the Rib Room. It's Rib Room. Oh, it's a boast reef. Yeah, roast beef. Oh. Okay, Edward, I guess we might as well try to bomb through another one today. I'm huh? kind of depressed. Did you see that memo that came out this morning? Yeah, I just got it. And the program director says the show yesterday was a real bomb. Please try to improve the comedy at least. The music could be better. The That's program director doesn't even sign his name anymore. Kind of gets you a little bit, you know. You yeah. work hard at, on a show and then something Too like bad. this happens. Yeah. You got a letter there. Maybe that's some good news. What, the letter? Yeah. Oh, let's see. I'm going to open it up here. Dear Mr. Squat and Mr. Walker, caught your show yesterday. If all my radio listening, I've never heard such a bad uh, program. The music was... Who, who's that from? Knox, huh? A listener in Falls Church. No wonder they're unhappy. Uh, terrible. Hey, yeah, uh, that reminds me, fellas. I, What's uh, that, Art? Kay, my wife, uh, caught the show yesterday. Said the only thing good about it was my engineering. Said the rest of it was pretty oh, bad. Oh, no. Why? They always seem to run like this. <laughs> What's Bob trying to say? <laughs> What's Bob saying? Said uh, Ruth caught the show yesterday. She didn't uh, think it was too good either. Was oh, it? that's terrible. Why, did, why don't they just leave us alone? I mean, so that one day we do a bad show. I'm gonna, yeah, you the can't clocks are off. I'm going to call. Yeah, they get the correct time. Well, you can't have all all good shows. Ti four two five two five. Ti four two five two five. Well, right, this will be all right anyway. That's been fantastic, amazing. You know. The correct time is six and one half minutes past four o'clock. Boy, it sure is refreshing to hear somebody with a nice, pleasant voice for a change. By the way, I caught your show yesterday, and it was a real bomb. Oh, for goodness sake! NBC Radio presents. Total Radio. Yes, the fall lineup of radio programs. Begin your day with... The Al Ross Show. Yes, the Al Ross Show from 5.30 till 9.30 every morning with music and news, sports and weather. Keep your day on the go with the Al Ross Show. Next on NBC's Total Radio. The Patty Cavan Show. The Patty Cavan Show with news, reviews, previews, and interviews every afternoon from 12.15 until 1 o'clock. Hear The Patty Cavan Show with our interesting guests on NBC Radio all week long. Next, in the middle of the afternoon at 4.05, it's the Scott and Walker Show, Total Radio. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Fawcett, your announcer, speaking to you from the Robert Hall Auditorium in Washington, D.C. We're about to hear the symphony orchestra under the direction of Serge Soot in a performance of Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, written, of course, by Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. In just a moment, the concert should begin, and there should be something unusual seems to be happening in the orchestra pit, ladies and gentlemen. The brass section are picking up their horns and are beginning to blow. <laughs> Pardon the pun. What I actually mean is they are beginning to leave the orchestra pit. I don't understand exactly what's going on. I will try to trip up one of the trumpeters as he comes by here. Hey, you tripped me up there, Jack. While you're watching, you almost bruised my sousaphone. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. Could you tell me? <laughs> yes. What is it? Why is the brass section leaving the orchestra pit? Aren't you going to perform the 1812 Overture? Oh, all us cats are going to get out of here. It's 405 in time for the Walker Scott Show. We always head south for the winter. I'll see you later. You forgot your sousaphone. <laughs> This is Peter Hacksaw from the NBC Newsroom in Washington, D.C., bringing you World News Roundup with direct reports from overseas and around the block. Headlines of the moment, spring thaw in the Kremlin, another missile launched at Cape Canaveral, and rice paddies invaded in the Far East. We'll have direct reports in just one moment, but first, hear this. Go ahead, that's your cue. Hear this. I can't find a copy. 
Uh, you know, we're not commercial in all these cities. There are You're few not commercial. Last time I had a spot was in 1937 during a yes. fireside chat. This is supposed to be a public service spot. Yeah, You're The girls upstairs, they spend less time on the phone with their boyfriend and more time with a cop. Stand by, I go on in 10 seconds. All right, I can't wait till you're fine. Oh, forget it. Just Please. give me the cue. Smokey the bear says or anything. No, I can't come on. Anything. Cue me. Here we go. Oh. Hey, once again, it's Peter Hacknose. Hacksaw. Hacksaw. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Now your NBC World News Roundup reports from overseas and around the block. Our lead story this morning, Spring Thaw in the Kremlin. For that story, we take you directly to Irving R. LeFink in Moscow. Irving R. LeFink speaking to you from Moscow. The Russians today, in a sudden protest, spring the threat, take a this is Peter Hacksaw in the NBC Newsroom in Moscow. No, this is Peter Hacksaw in the NBC Newsroom in Washington. You are Irving R. LaFink. Boy doesn't even know his own name. Our next story this morning, another missile being launched at Cape Canaveral in Florida. For that story, we call in Jay Strawberry. Very speaking to you from Cape Canaveral, in Florida. Well, it was a beautiful sight. As the first dawn of morning streak across the sky, we saw these beautiful, 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 beautiful. <laughs> The missile soared up about 6,000 feet. <laughs> this is Jay Strawberry at Cape Canaveral. We seem to be having a few technical difficulties this morning. We'll try our final story of the day. Rice paddies being invaded in the Far East. For that story, we call in Cecil Bill in Asia. Let me do that with you, fellas. Come in, Cecil Bill in Asia. Cecil Bill speaking to you in Asia Minor. Well, the rice paddy situation in China. Three of the rains at the end time of the festival season. This is Cecil Bill returning you to CBS News in New York. Just a moment, Cecil. This is Peter Hacksaw. This is NBC News in Washington. I think you must be reporting for the wrong network. Don't give me none of your stuff, Jack. I work for the Associated Press as a freelancer. I don't care who pays me. I come down to it for Mutual, Dumont, some of the local indies across the country. Just send the check. Cecil Bill. C-E-C-I-A-B-I-L-L. Cecil Bill. Thank you, Cecil. That is our World News Roundup. Peter Hacksaw reporting from the NBC Newsroom. Hey, I found a promo. I found a promo. Forget it. The show Horse over fires now. this year destroyed more than six... This is the NBC Radio. Radio Network. Pictures presents an exciting new motion picture that dares to tell the truth. The shocking Frank story about young America, brown corduroy. Here is Miss Joan Clawfoot to tell you all about it. This is the story of two kids who just yesterday were playmates. Kids in brown corduroy. But today they have fallen in love. Hopelessly, maddeningly in love. They're nice kids, but the people who made the movie are not nice people because they just hired me and paid me $5 to come over here and do this crummy commercial. They wouldn't even give me a part in the picture. Miss Clover, All I have to say please. is, of all the movies that I've ever seen, I would just, what? Well, Miss Clover, please, I mean, we're doing a commercial here. Would you mind doing it? You get yes, I know, I'm doing a commercial. Why wouldn't they give me a part in the picture? Look, that's not After the point. all, I should be the star of Brown Corduroy. Nobody can do this it's part as well as I could. Brown Corduroy. NBC Radio presents Wagon Train. The year was 1871, as another pitiful pack of puny pioneers pushed their way forward, westward toward the great western Pacific country. Josiah J. Josiah was one of those pioneers. He was in Wagon Train 38, just fresh out of Omaha. Ahoy there, Josiah! Are you going west to build a new way of life for your family, a new home, a new business, a new empire for yourself? No, I'm going out west to plant grapes in the San Fernando Valley in California and make Manischewitz wine. But, Josiah, I just saw Morgan David and the two trains ahead of you. Uh-oh. Hi-ho, hi me. Hi me. It's time once more for Ted Crack and the original Armature Hour, the man who's given more starts to upstarts than any man in the business. And now, here he is, your genial host, the man who wants to put you on the stage, Ted Crack and the original Armature Hour! Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and around and around and around she goes, and where the old wheel stops, nobody knows. 
except the producer because he's rigged the show. Welcome once again to the 247,000th edition of the original Armature Hour, where this week we're going to bring some new talent before your very eyes. Last week, as you'll recall, our 95-year-old musical saw player, Joe Frampton from Hoboken, New Jersey, received 475,000 votes. He'll be back a little later on in the show. Now it's time for our first contestants. And coming out here this evening, I see two, uh, a brother and a sister. Tell me, sir, what is your name, please, sir? Right there in front of the microphone. Uh, hello, Mr. Crack. It's certainly nice to see you <laughs> and be with you again. Yes, Mr. Crack. I see. It's nice to have you. What is your name, please, sir? My name is Marvin Marvin. Marvin Marvin, and this is your sister? This is my sister. Myrtle Marvin. Myrtle, I see. say hello to the nice man. Hello to... Say hello. Hello to the nice man. Oh. Fine, thank you. Have me doing it now. All right, now, it says Certainly here... Certainly a pleasure to be on your show, Mr. Crack. A pleasure having you. You're one of my ambitions for years. You won our... We uh, blew the Godfrey Talent Scout show, and we were hoping we'd get on this one pretty soon. We get a lot of rejects, yes. I uh, see you won the Edgewood Arsenal auditions. Our group was down there last week. <laughs> we were really big at Harper's Ferry, too. We hit the state fair circuit in that uh, part of the country. Tell me, sir, what are you going to do? It says here you are our flamenco dancer and singer. Is That's that exactly right, mister. Uh, would you like to give our hometown a plug, Mr. Crack? If yes, you want... where you are from, whereabouts? Uh, you Harper's got, Ferry? You got the card, didn't Harper's you? Ferry, West Virginia is the hometown. All you folks... Folks watching down there, be sure to give us a call. The number here is Bigelow 473-529-642. Excuse JR me, before you... Five, oh. Hey, Mr. Crack, uh, we got an engagement at 12 o'clock. Oh. If you don't mind, let's All right, let's, let's watch them now. The Marvin. Marvin Marvin and Myrtle Marvin, brother and sister act as they do something. Uh, wait a minute. I put a guitar and she sings. Let's make sure we establish oh, okay. that. Okay, you play the guitar and she sings. Right, okay. Can I play the castanet? Okay. All right, let's, up, Myrtle, let's, let's hear from the there. Marvin act now. You're watching now the Marvin Brothers. If you don't mind, Mr. Crack, the phone number mind. here is Wigelow 4732695. Would you mind not to not be clogging up our act, Mr. Crack? We're trying to do a little bit for the people right. out here. Go, Myrtle! Yes, 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 yes! In case you want to call in. New York, the number oh, is Murray Hills. Hey, you're wrecking my sister's singing there. Mr. Crack, would you mind not singing while my sister's before I have built you right in the mouth? Wait a minute, young man. I have to uh, do, I want to give you a break here. I'm going to give you a break right out of your head. My sister's been working on that act for 14 years. Now, just a little All right, ladies, here are the New York. Call Mr. Crack at the hospital now. His number is Bigelow 4 3218. He'll be there in 10 minutes. Come on, Myrtle, let's get out of this crazy place. <laughs> Six months of broadcasting, you didn't fall over the mic cable. Practice all morning. Good girl. Now, here she is, our own stabilizing factor in the program, Miss Janitor, with the Washington temperature. Six to four. Three to two. Eight to seven. Nine to five. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are you, what are you giving here? Baseball score. Mm -hmm. All righty. That's very good. Baseball, of course. That's yeah. something that I'm sure people are interested in. That's right. You're on the right track. Mm -hmm. There's only one thing wrong. What? What are the teams that are playing? You gave the scores, but... How should I know? What do you mean, how should you know? Well, that's all that came over the wire. They had a narrow piece of tape on the machine. And... You mean all you got is the numbers? Yes, I don't have the teams. You have no idea who the teams are? I don't even know one team from another. That's great. Uh-huh, I think so, too. Swings, yeah. Bye. Okay, well, let's... Bye. I don't believe it. Miss Janet here, the Washington weather girl. Oh, I knew it was too good to last. Call a doctor. And girls, gather around your radio, for the National Broadcasting Company takes great pleasure in presenting once again 
your friendly little storyteller, kindly old Uncle Oswald, who has endeared himself to millions of little boys and girls just like you all over the country, telling little fairy tales. Now, here he is, kindly old Uncle Oswald. Thank you, Willard Scott, and good afternoon, boys and girls. Once again, it's time for another story from the land of make-believe. Before we begin, Willard, would you pour me some of the stuff out of that pitcher into a glass for me, please? Certainly, so kind. It's a trifle dry this afternoon. Certainly, Uncle kindly, old Uncle Oswald. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now then, boys and girls, once upon a time, there was a lovely little girl named Little Red Riding Hood who had won a Miss Marilyn contest and things of that nature. She lived on oh, River Road. I beg your pardon. She was just a little girl, a class who lived in the woods. I'm sorry. By the way, would you put an olive in that glass for me, Willow? Certainly, kindly, old Uncle Oswald. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, that's better. One day, Little Red Riding Hood's mother said, Red, would you be so kind as to take a basket of goodies to your aunt, who is very sick? No, no, Uncle Oswald. Uncle, Oswald. Church. Uncle Oswald, it was her grandmother who was ill. Oh, yes, of course, her grandmother. She lived in Rockville. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. By the way, would you put a dash of bitters in that for me? Just a trifle dry. Certainly, Uncle Oswald. Thank you. Mm, that's good. Thank you. Now then, Little Red Riding Hood was a good, obedient girl, so she wanted to do what her mother told her to, so she went by the Safeway and bought a basket of goodies. And it was proceeded... a giant food store. Oh, yes, of course. And she proceeded to... Could you put a wedge of lemon in there for me, please? I think so, Uncle Oswald. Well, let's put Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. So she went down the road, and she encountered a mean old fox. No, it was a wolf, and this... Uncle Oswald. A wolf. Yes. Oh, ah. yes, a wolf. And this wolf said, well, when are you going red? And she said, I'm going to see my grandmother, who has a touch of hay fever. Asthma. And asthma, yes. And, uh, by the way, could you just mix that up a little bit for me? It's a trifle flat. I don't know what's wrong with this beverage here. The ice is also melted yes, out. Yes, drop a cube of ice in there for me, sir, would you please? Thank you. So the mean old wolf decided that he would get there before Red Riding Hood and eat the grandmother. Ah! On the way over... Red Riding Hood stopped by the home of the three bears. No, Hal, no, Ehrlich, no. and Marriott. No, no, no. And wait, wait, wait a minute. There were no through. This is another story, Uncle Oswald. Oh, I always get her mixed up with Goldilocks. I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. Mm-hmm. So finally, Red got to her... She lives in the Woodner, I believe. That's right, yes. Yeah. Red Riding Hood got to her grandmother's house, and she knocked on the door. And, of course, the mean, the mean old wolf had been there before and had eaten the grandma. And uh, the wolf said, who's there? And Red Riding Hood said, it's me, grandma. I, grandma. Oh, it is I, grandma, and I've got a basket of goodies for you. Can I come in? And the wolf said, yes, of course you may come in. Would you just stir that up a little? Yeah, oh, sure, Uncle Oswald. And uh, so Little Red Riding Hood went on inside, and she said, my grandma, what big eyes you have. Teeth. The first. Oh, the teeth? teeth. And the, oh, and the wolf said, yes. We're getting the cut signal. It has to be teeth. Oh, it does? Yeah. Well, yes, he said, the better to eat you with, my dear. And he jumped up, put a little tenderizer on Red Riding Hood and started to eat her. But just at that time, mind you, somebody from the welcome wagon stopped by because... With the woodsman, Grant. Oh, the woodsman yeah, stopped by, and, and he killed the mean old wolf, married Red Riding Hood, and they lived happily ever after. And that, my boys and girls, is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Great moments in history. Facts and true stories behind momentous events that have helped to shape the present-day world. And now, for today's exciting true story on Great Moments in History. Our scene was Boston, Massachusetts. The year was 1775. The story about the great Boston Tea Party and how it actually happened. We are inside a large warehouse outside the harbor of Boston. <laughs> a group of men are seated around the mahogany table. I don't know. Why do they want us here, anyway? Gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, please attention to this. Yes. I suppose you all wonder why I've called you here this afternoon. That's correct. Why did you call us here this afternoon? Are you here, young and Rubicon? Yes. Are you here, J. Walter Thompson? No. Are you here, Burton, Barton, Desmond, and Osborne? We're all here. Very good. Are you here, McCann Erickson? Yes, we're here. Are you here, Carol Lick and Medic? Yes, we're here. Very good. We are ready now for our tea party. Are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Why don't you have ice tea more often? Why don't you have ice tea tonight? Now, yes, gentlemen, this is a new campaign for tea this year. What do you think? I think it's a smash, and someday it'll go down in history as the Boston Tea Party. Sensational. 
And that's today's great moment in history. The real story behind the Boston Tea Party. Why it was organized. What was its result. And how it came to be. And I'm sick. From out of Northwest on MacArthur Boulevard come the thundering hoofbeats of the Great Horse Platinum. With a cloud of dust and a hearty high host slobber, the sod buster rides again. <laughs> Nowhere in the pages of history can you find a greater champion of justice. A more fearless, hard-riding, straight-shooting, beer-drinking, peace-eating son of a sod. It's the Sod Buster. <laughs> a true gentleman of the old school. Men feared him. Little children respected him. Women loved him. A true gentleman. days of any old year when out of Northwest we find the Hoofbeats Great Horse, Platinum, and the Sod Busters. <laughs> In and around the territory of Hyattsville, on beyond Tacoma Park, out toward Rockville, on past Route 240, up toward Frederick County, roll the Sod Buster and his sidekick, Chester Drawer. Come here, Chester. <laughs> Oh, mister, mister, you kicked me right in the side. That's because you're my sidekick, Chester. That's the corniest line since who to be. The sun had just settled down in the sleepy town of Brockville. As our story opens, the sod buster, U.S. Marshal Matt Dillard, was inside of his office. Chester walks in. Let's see. There's the porch in there. Chester, that limp is getting worse. Sit down, Chester. Rest the spell. Oh, see, Mr. Dillard, it sure has been hot these past few. Next page. They, uh, yes, it sure has, Chester. What's she doing in the office today, Marshal? Oh, just waiting. Waiting for what, Marshal? Phone call, Chester. A phone call, Mr. Dillard? Yeah, I can't tell you what it is, Chester. It's a big secret. Why, Mr. Dillard, you can tell me I'm your sidekick. No, Chester, this is bigger than both of us. I'm just afraid to talk about it, because if I do, something will happen. Now, that's downright foolishness, Marshal. You can tell me what the phone call is all about, our nation. Chester, I haven't even told Kitty about it. <laughs> now, that's it. Hello? Marshal Dillard. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Fine. Bye-bye. Now, yeah. Chester, that's Marshall. it. Now, maybe you can tell me why all the tarnation mystery about the phone call. Yes, I can, Chester. Who was it from, Marshal? It was my agent in New York. He got me a guest shot on Maverick next week. That's what I've been waiting for all my life, Chester. Marshal? What? There's just one thing that bothers me. What's that, Chester? How come you got a phone call and they ain't even invented the telephone yet? I was afraid you'd put a damper on the whole thing. You've been listening to the exciting adventures of the Top Buster. Written for radio by Larry DeRitz. Produced by Bertie Harrison. Directed by Dave Reckway. The entire production is supervised for NBC Radio by Bernice Will Neck. <laughs> This is Raymond, your host, welcoming you to Inner Sanctum. Welcome. This evening, we present another story for your late evening listening. <laughs> Full of ghouls and goblins and ghosts. Tonight's story titled... Murder at Midnight. It was just past midnight. I was walking in the house alone. The wind was whistling outside. I'd gotten the note in the mail that morning, and I knew they were coming to kill. They were coming to kill. They were coming to kill. They told me in the note that they were coming to kill. I didn't know what to do. I quickly walked and checked every door in the house. I walked over to the windows to make sure they were locked tight. They called me and told me they were coming to kill. I 
knew they were coming to kill. And it wouldn't be long before they'd be here to kill. All of a sudden, I heard a knock at the door. In terror, I tore back to the wall as fast as I could. I got up against the wall, and then the door was jammed open. And there he was, standing at the doorway, with his instruments of death to kill. I'm Otto the Yorkin man, I'm Otto the Yorkin man, what's for my defense, it's just common sense, call Otto the Yorkin man. You see, we'd, we'd had bugs in our house, termites, crawling things, they'd been all over the house. Oh, was I glad to see that Otto. This is your janitor reporter, Willard Scott, speaking to you from the Lion House at the Washington Zoo here in Washington, D.C. at the beautiful Rock Creek Park. And your janitor microphone is here at feeding time at the zoo, and we're going to discuss feeding time with the head zookeeper and the head feeder here at the Lion House, Mr. Clyde Booty. Mr. Booty, good afternoon, sir. Glad to know you. Welcome to our show. It's wonderful to have you. Well, who is this tremendous lion? This great big. He looks like he's a uh, uh, about a 300-pound lion. Here. That's Leo, one of our favorite lions over here. But I thought he looked familiar. Have I? He had a contract with MGM there for a long time. How old is this lion? Uh, this lion must be about uh, 15, 20 years old. Well, this is certainly an interesting lion. I've uh, never... Grocious cat. Really quite a beast. Where yes. was he captured? He was captured in uh, Africa, brought back by uh, one of the outstanding explorers, Frank Buck or Frank Bill or somebody like that years ago. Oh, I see. Well, good. Uh, you're going to feed the lion for us, aren't you? He uh, brings to be here at feeding time. That's right. Of course, today's Monday. These lions haven't been fed all weekend, and they're just a little bit hungry. We give them a, an extra dose on Monday. Aren't you a little nervous? about going into a lion cage? Not at all, no. I've worked with lions. I've been working with the cats for years in the circus, and I've trained them, and, you know, they know me. They know their master. Well, we're very familiar with bad lions on this program, so uh, we like to watch you go in and Don't feed. mind me. I'm just mixing up uh, a little bit of food here. A little oh, no, help beef. yourself. Yeah, uh, see that. It's about two pounds of beef over there. Yeah, and some here. cornmeal for... Good, yeah, another yeah, there we are. And a little protein in there. A lot of raw vegetables. So go and, ahead uh, and open the cage, and we'll watch you. All right, now, stand back, uh, fellas. Hey, how do we get here? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, apparently the uh, meal that the lion tamer fixed up for the lion wasn't enough, but the lion managed to make a meal out of the lion tamer anyway. We, this lion, I think somebody ought to give him some bites of all. We switch you now back to our studio. The greatest name in bird feed. The only bird feed that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as a bear brings you the exciting true life story of just plain Stella Bear. Starring Margaret Hotburn in the title role of Stella Bear, kind Lil Liffy. Is our story open? It is late Friday night. Mama Bear and Papa Bear and their wealthy young 38-year-old playboy son Herbert Bear have just planned a voyage to Ocean City where they're spending the weekend. They arrive, however, at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the only hotel that's open is an old beat-up rickety place down on the south side, and they get a room on the 10th floor. As they open up, apparently they're just gotten all set, and they're going up to the floor now to get to Your room is on the 10th floor. You'll find it very comfortable. Thank you so much, dearie. Thank you a whole lot. Yeah, that's right, man. Thank Come you very much. Well. <laughs> Tenth floor, I guess I'm to walk all the way up there. Oh, boy. Here, it's nice to be able to go to Ocean Harbor. I'll be plumb tuckered out. Tenth floor there, Paul. Boy, you sure is a steep staircase they got here, isn't it, Ma? Don't drop the booze, Herbert. <laughs> oh, no. Hope oh, the sun is shining. Well, I want to get a nice sun pan out there. I'm sorry. Uh, page three of his shoes. They can put a bee in there. Ooh, that's a bear, isn't it? It's eighth floor. Eighth floor. I don't think yeah. that's going to make it. I'm all pooped up. Yeah, let me help you push up then, boy. <laughs> boy, this sure is a tough climb. Why haven't I had so much? I see ninth floor. There's one more to go. I'm beginning to draw a beak. I think I'm an eagle. I'll be in the mess. <clears throat> you know, something we must have been pretty far up. My nose is beginning to bleed. Harper, don't be vulgar. The league hasn't cleared it. It's gone. There it is, Ma. 
Okay, room 63B. Yeah, you get okay. out the key and open the door, Ma. Patrick, you and Papa Bear the key. We don't have the key. I thought Papa Bear had the key. Papa no, Bear I don't have the key, Ma. Nobody's got the key. They didn't think I had the key, did you? Well, I did, sure, but I'll be doggone if I'm going to walk all the way down there and get those keys, oh, I'll tell you. Oh, you won't have to walk, Herbert. What do you mean? Come here. What are you doing? Ah. Oh! Oh! about you, wild man, you're getting paid. The only name in Percy that makes your parakeet look like an ape, sound like a lion, and gentle as a bear has brought you the exciting, heartwarming story of just plain Stella Bear. Based on the book Not Enough, Soon Enough by Claudia Clyde, adapted for radio by Geraldine Fitz. <coughs> Geraldine, this is a Sherman D. Tank production. Here's the mantelpiece so I can stand to eat my dinner. I want Put your teeth away, young man. It's some death. WRC 62nd editorial. Here's WRC's 18th vice, vice president with an editorial for the birds. WRC Radio believes in money. You might say we have a yen for yen. For years, money has been the backbone on which our economy has been built. Money creates jobs. Jobs create people working. People working create traffic jams downtown. Traffic jams create listeners and cars. Listeners and cars listen to radio. And that, in turn, creates more money for radio. We're in business for money. You're in business for money. And we're in business to get your money. Answer me a question. Has there ever been a time, has there ever been a place where money wasn't accepted, wasn't popular? No, no, and again, I say no. Regardless of who you are, no matter where you are, remember, you're never far. You're always near. It's always welcome. It's always in vogue. Money, money, money. Wherever distinguished people congregate, you'll always find money. You've just heard a one-minute editorial for the birds. Well, that's one way to put it. Right now, the time has come to walk down the hall to Betty Crockett's experimental kitchen. Come on, Willie boy. Okay, Edward, let's go. A little beef behind the door here now, so we can start to get this yeah. thing open. I'll help you open the door. Oh, that door's sticking every day. There, there it goes. goes. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Welcome to Betty Crockett's experimental kitchen. Each Tuesday afternoon of this time, WRC presents a visit with its home economist, Miss Betty Crockett, of the Queen of the Kitchen Range. Here she is, lovable Betty Crockett. Hello, Eddie. Hi, Betty. How are you? How are you? You look good today. Fine as a fiddle. Betty, can I have some of that jelly roll? Arthur, get your hands off the jelly roll. Besides, I ain't going to give nobody none of my jelly roll. Sounds like an old Phil Harris record there. Well, Betty, uh, yes, looks hello, as though you're Betty. working hard in the kitchen today. Yes, I am, Eddie. Mm -hmm. How are you? Fine. Good to see you, fella. Same here. Looking so good, how, Susan? Just fine, Betty. Cutest of, oh, that's the cutest baby. Thank you, Betty. I saw her yesterday. Uh -huh, she's she's so cute. cute out of friendship. I see them. She likes you, too. How about our... Uh, he likes recipe? the college boys, Eddie. Uh-huh, yeah, uh, 15 just 15 months cute. old. That's oh, a cute child, Eddie. How about our recipe just for today? Just these cute little things I ever did see. How's Nancy? Just fine. Wonderful, uh -huh. Eddie. How about our recipe Who's for Who's that big fellow over there? That's Willard. Hello, Betty. <laughs> oh, sort of my ignored God. Willard. Your hair's growing back, Bunky. Uh -huh. Thank but, you. Really. How about our recipe? I'd like to, yes. All right, let's have it. Didn't you bring it? Well, no, that's what I came down here for. You have the recipe. I, no, I... No, what? see, that's your, here it is, right oh. here on this card. All right. You had it laying right there on the stove. Oh, Betty's getting absent-minded yes. here. Now, what, what is our recipe for today? Is Sometimes I do miss my mind every once in a while, uh, just yes. for fun. Sure. Well, today, Eddie, I thought the girls would like to know about some salted seagulls. Oh, that sounds like a rare delicacy, something I've never heard of, salted seagulls. That's right. You get them now, especially fresh down around the water, don't you know? Yeah, they do fly mm -hmm. in near the shore, they're, don't they? They're shore birds, yes. Well, how do you mm -hmm. catch them? 
Well, uh, any way you want to. Why? Well, I mean, you've got to get one before you can salt it, don't you? That's right. Yes, uh, pre preferably you get one and salt him down. Uh, just salt him all the way around. Huh? Salt him on his tail and let him fly. Uh, and then you uh, cook him and serve him? No, that's just it. It's a, it's a beach party. It's nothing to eat. You don't eat him? That's a recipe for fun. Well, what's the point in salting a seagull if you're not going to eat it? Well, it's just National Be Kind to Seagulls Week, oh, and I, I thought you'd go out and salt oh, one. Fine. Right? Thank you very oh, much, Betty. Get uh, your uh, hands on my jelly roll. roll. Right on. Well, there you have it. Another visit with our charming home economist, Miss Betty Crockett, queen of the kitchen range. Join us next Tuesday for another recipe. Until then, Betty Crockett says... Goodbye, everybody, and so long until tomorrow. So long, Betty. Here we are in the midst of July, and here's the girl with a sty on her eye stepping out of her glass booth here. Oh, my heavens there. BBI's, you you busted everything there. You Sorry. fell right over the mic cable. Will you watch it, please? You didn't expect me to wear a patch over that eye to cover it up. Did you? No, Van Heusen, I didn't. I just thought that I thought I'd... I'm sorry I brought the whole thing. Right. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Washington's own weather girl to give us the temperatures for the Washington area. Thank you. Wait a minute. Here she is, Miss Janitor. Meatloaf, 220. Toll House Cookies, 350. Apple Turnovers, 310. Wait a minute, Aunt Jemima. Hialeah, 460. Hialeah, 460. Now, wait, wait a minute. What are you, what are you doing? What now, are you... this is National Use Your Oven Week, and I'm giving temperatures of things that you can bake in the oven. I think you've just cooked your own goose on this program, Miss Janet. <laughs> really? <laughs> I think so, yeah. You, uh, really, this is the new heights of being completely out of it as far Sorry. as... Sorry. Hmm? Have a toll house cookie. Oh, Hmm, they're pretty good. You bake these yourself? Yes. You're a pretty good cookie baker. Mm -hmm. I didn't never realize. Bye. 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 been another ringworm arrangement there. You had the wrong page, kids. Uh, weatherman says actually mostly cloudy with occasional showers and a few scattered thunderstorms this afternoon, tonight, and Thursday. <laughs> High near 80 degrees today and tomorrow. Low about 68 tonight. Temperature right now, 77 degrees. Relative humidity, 73 percent. That's what the weatherman has to say. Die hard. They just never will say die. Well, I huh? think he did that on purpose. I'm yeah, sure. I just have a little laugh here. <laughs> Frank Forrest will come down and cut your barometer out of your head. No, <laughs> no. No. Do a spot or something with it. I'm sure that all of you who work in offices are familiar with the inner office memo. And we at NBC, of course, receive inner office memos too. Some of them, some of them are really works of art. So we feel it only fair that we should share these literary gems of wisdom with you, our audience. And so we present for your listening edification, memos from management. First of all, memo 1356. Dash A to Bill Grayson, or rather from Bill Grayson, program director, to all staff announcers. In making station breaks, please omit the expression broadcast house, as this has been used by another station. Regards, BG. Our next memo, 1452, from the building engineer to all people having occasion to use the studio area. Please refrain from bringing food into the radio and TV broadcasting studio. Recently, a ham sandwich was discovered in the announcing booth for television, and some of the announcers took it personally. Thanks for your cooperation, Charlie. Memo 1683 from Mr. Fritz Balzer, music director, to all those having occasion to use 
records or transcriptions on the air. Recently, it has come to my attention that someone has been filing the news on the hour beeper theme in the Patty Cavan Phil music bin. If Miss Cavan were to ever need Phil music, that is, if and when this were ever possible, it would be most embarrassing. Let's all try and help. Yours for better broadcasting, Fritz. And now, finally, memo 1465 from George McKinnon, building superintendent, to all employees. Recently, an incident involving a little old lady who was taking a tour of the station with one of the pages took place that should not be repeated if possible. She became separated from the tour and did not show up until three days later when somebody put a dime in the chewing gum machine to get some chiclets and instead of chiclets, out came the little old lady. This kind of carelessness is bad for public relations. So let's try and put a stop to it. Would advise being a little more careful when attempting to jimmy the vending machine. Thank you. Join us next when we present literary inner office memos from management. Yes, Marco Polo was a charter member of the three A's. No, Rudy Valley is not a geographical location in Southern California. Yes, R.J. Reynolds rolls his own. No, Worcester on the Stake is not the name of a city in England. It's time once more for radio's time-honored program, The Answer Man. Now in its 83rd year, each week at this time, The Answer Man answers the questions you, the radio listeners, have sent to him. And now, here he is, the answer man. Well, good afternoon, friends, and thank you, Willard Scott. I see we have a big stack of mail here today. A real snoot, uh, uh, full. Yes, Mr. Answer Man. All right, let's get to our first letter. A lady from Silver Spring writes, mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, a traveling hobo offered to repair my TV set for a free meal. Yes. <laughs> While working on it, the set tipped over and fell on him. That was two weeks ago, and the set is still on the bum. I, I hated to do that. I think that's one of the better ones we've had. I'm uh, I think she wrote to the wrong department there. I don't think it's I can handle it. It's better than the bum. When it's on the bum, the hobo is a bum. Yeah, get... I get the gag, but uh, I'm sorry. Did. Next question. A curious listener from Rockville writes, what is that space between your teeth called? It's your mouth. What do you think it is between your upper and lower? That's All a right. ridiculous question. A young horse lover from Potomac would like to know, how do you raise a horse? Well, you could light a fire under him or uh, all sorts of things. They get a crowbar and lift him up in the air if you want to, one thing and another. A gentleman from just off Rock Creek Park writes, what is the age-old and tested formula for making corn plaster? Well, now, that's an interesting question. First of all, you take a little corn, mash it up, uh, let it age there for about 20 minutes, uh, run it through the thing, the distillery, and you drink that corn and you're going to get plastered. That's You've been listening to Radio's time-honored program, The Answer Man, maybe for the last time. If you have any questions for which you'd like the answers, just address a card or letter to The Answer Man, WRC Radio, Red Square, Hartburn 2, Virginia, along with $745 to cover the cost of handling and mailing. Be with us again next week when once again we'll present The Answer Man. That's still on the bomb. I like that. <laughs> Not a bad <laughs> gag, Mushmouth, speaking to you from Ping Pong on the Ball, here at the sunny southern coastal regions of England, where we're broadcasting this afternoon the Ping Pong Tournament of the World. It's the final game of this three-day match that has gone on between Sir Adrian Applejack, Ping Pong champion of Wessex, and Sir Alistair Wigwag, who is the London champion of Ping Pong. Now the final game is about to get underway. Sir Adrian picks up his paddle. Thank you, sir, Sir Adrian, sir. Sir Alistair picks up his paddle, <laughs> and the judge now bids the game go on. Go on, yeah. Serve that beautiful serve by Sir Alistair. A return there. Nice return by Sir Adrian Applejack. Sir Alistair seems to be in a bit of a trouble there. He's up. That's a long Oh, that's a beautiful serve by Sir Adrian. A wonderful. Oh, look at that tremendous recovery by Sir Adrian. It's a marvelous game. Oh, there is two, three, four, six, seven, ten, twenty-one. The game is all over. That's wonderful. That's marvelous. Sir Adrian is the new champion. How about that? Sir Adrian. Sir Adrian is the new champion. Sir Adrian. Sir Adrian. Sir Adrian, in ping pong, one is not supposed to jump over the net. <laughs> oh dear. Now they tell me. And now, from Warner Systems, a new grandiose motion picture. This Crabgrass is mine, starring Rock Rockpile and Marcia Swamp. And now here's the star of this Crabgrass is mine, Rock Rockpile. Hi, said. I'm Rock Rockpile, and I'm starring in the wonderful new motion picture, This Crabgrass Was Mine, with Marcia Swamp. 
I've been in some dramatic motion pictures, ladies and gentlemen, in my life, but never have I been in a duller, a more dramatic motion picture than this crabgrass was mine. Here, ladies and gentlemen, in my humble opinion, is the most dramatic scene that I've ever played with Marcia Swamp as my supporting actress. John, I know what you want. That's right, Marcia. I came here for what I had to come here for. Crabgrass. John, do you think for one minute that my father would sell you crabgrass? That's not the point. If I don't have your father's crabgrass, I'll lose everything I have. I've worked for 40 years to get crabgrass. I've got crabgrass everywhere in town, stored up, waiting for this big move. And now you tell me I can't have your father's crabgrass. I... All right, John. In this envelope, it's what you've been waiting for. Your father's lunch. It's your paper bag again. Yes. I don't want a lunch. I got plenty. I, got, I need crabgrass. That's what I need, crabgrass. All right, John. I'll give you the crabgrass. But I don't want you to think for one minute that I love you. You don't love me? No. I don't even like you. You don't like me? As a matter of fact, I... I hate you. See, This Crabgrass Was Mine starts Thursday at the Lowe's High Theater. Oh. What? <laughs> Fidel, you're not on till Sunday. Give us agent break. WRC, though. WRC, FM, NBC, in Washington. My part, wait sound. a minute. It's Five o'clock, and here's the network. Annals of American history come the true stories of Major John Singleton Nosby, CSA, Confederate States of America, and the story of the Yellow Ghost. We got our men from Texas, from the mountains, the backwoods, and the plains. We got them from West Virginia, from Tacoma Park, Hyattsville. We were short three men, so we got some from Bermuda, plus the Bermuda shorts. Both Yebs and Ranky strangers, they called us Nosby strangers. Both north and south, they knew my fame. Yellow Ghost is what they call me. Chicken Little is my name. This is the story of Major John Singleton Nosby, CSA, Confederate States of America, of the Yellow Ghost. As our story opens, Major Nosby and his sidekick, Sergeant Miles, are standing inside the telegrapher's office. Apparently, they're waiting word from Lee in Richmond. Yes, Sergeant. Any moment now, I expect to have the word from Lee in Richmond. Sooner of a gun, Major. Is Lee going to send you another message by telegram? That's right, Sergeant. I wish you'd take some speech lessons. This is very embarrassing when we have to sit down at the conference table. Wait, 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 Major. Major, it's coming through now. Let me write it down quickly. Right, catch it for me, Sergeant. I got the message, sir. I get it. That's it. It's from Lee. Okay. Let's see it. There it is, Major. Yes. It's, it's from Lee. It's from Lee in Richmond. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. It says, two shirts, one pair of spats, pair of pants, two derby hats. Good, good. Sir, is this from General Lee in Richmond? No, it's from Wong Lee, a Chinese laundry operator in Richmond. I sent all my clothes out to him, Sergeant. Son of a gun. You sure are stupid, but you're clean. Both north and south, they knew our fame. Yellow Ghost is what they call me. Chicken Little is my name. Here at WRC, where the WRC engineers have just finished their four o'clock afternoon tea. The engineers apparently are coming back to work to do their little jobs around the station as we join them in the lounge. Okay, uh, fellas, uh, I'm ready now to go in and uh, do the Willard Scott and Ed Walker show. The voice you're listening to is that of Arthur Page, the engineer who does the Walker Scott show from 405 to 6. Carry on. Now then, uh, before I go into the studio, fellas, I wish that you would join me in a chorus of our engineer's song to sort of encourage me to do a superb job this afternoon because this show is such a complete nothing. <laughs> All right, if you give me a couple of notes on the piano there. Uh, well, here we go. All right. High fidelity, 
hi fi's the thing for me. With an LP disc and an FM set and a quarter of reflex cabinet. High frequency range, complete with auto change. All the highest notes, neither sharp nor flat. Right. The ear can't hear as high as that. You said it. Still, I ought oh, to please, please every awesome. passing bat. With my high LP. Thanks, fellas. I know I'll be a smash. The time that all the women have been waiting for, so let's just uh, peruse down the hall here a little bit. What do you say? Okay, here? our experimental visit with our experimental girlfriend, right? All right, here's the kitchen. Let's uh, lean on the door here a little bit. Okay, I'll give it a little... There we go. Yeah. Welcome to Betty Crockett's experimental kitchen. Each Tuesday afternoon at this time, WRC is proud to present their home economist, Miss Betty Crockett, queen of the kitchen reign. Here she is in her experimental kitchen, Miss Betty Crockett. Good afternoon, Betty, and how are you today? Hello, Eddie. Hello, Eddie. How are you? Fine. How are you, Betty? Good to see you, Eddie. Can I have some of that sound of sunflower? Ow! Get your hands off my sunflower cookie sheet. I don't oh, know what's got into good, you. Though. You're a regular two-time glutton, Paige. Every time you come in old Betty's kitchen, you get your hands all over the food. Well, I don't get nothing to eat at home, you see. Well, that's not my fault. If your wife can't fill up that grotesque tank No, 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 no. Let's be Please, Betty, a little pleasant little, on the air. A little restraint here, darling. Well, I don't oh, care about no darling restraint. Well, all right. Uh, how about a recipe, then? Uh, yes, I thought the girls might like a little something special today, don't you know? Yeah, clear your throat, please. A little hot weather menu. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I got a frog in my throat. Do you really? Oh, I yeah, oh, oh I hear him, yes. Uh -huh. He's down there, just a chirping. Well, what, a, what kind of recipe do you have for the girls today? Mm-hmm, surely you do. That's nice. What What is it? What's that, Daddy? The recipe. Oh, the recipe, yes. yes. Well, today I thought the girls might like a little something extra special, so I fixed up something good for just what ails you. Oh, what ails us? Well, I think you're sick in the head. Oh, I see. Well, what do you think the girls would like uh, for recipe? It's called Herringbone Hangover. Well, there's a novel title. I assume that it's made from herring. Is that right? Exactly, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Most work? men have... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's all right. All right, sir. What are you doing? Sneaking behind the stove over oh, there. Oh, I found another one of them sunflower cookies over there. Disgusting is what you are, you big old engineer. All right, let's get back to the recipe here. Well, most husbands around the house have an old herringbone suit, don't you know? True. Mm hmm. And nine times out of ten, there's a little material that's hung over. You mean, uh... Not the husband, the suit. The suit is the hung, over. hung yes, over, I yeah. see what you mean, yes. Uh -huh. You cut over the hangover, and you put it in a pot and boil it for about an hour and a half with some parsley snipes and a little reddish juice and a side order of vicious woos, and that's it. Oh, that doesn't have anything to do with herring. Well, that's herring bone. I didn't oh. say it was that kind of herring. Is this supposed to be good to eat? What? Uh, I say, are you supposed to eat this? No, you sit around and finger it with your big old fat fingers. Oh, what do you mean? Of course you eat it. Well, it doesn't sound very well, appetizing. Well, a bunch. I've never in my life seen anything like it. Well, Isn't thank you very much, Betty. That uh, certainly is a... They don't treat me this way on the Mark Evans show recipe. when I go over there to get Just my... one little cookie. If right. you don't get Ow. big hands off the cookie sheet... So we leave this domestic bliss for another week. Never we'll be back next Tuesday when well, we have another visit from Betty Crockett, our experimental kitchen. Let's get out of here. Close the door. And now, Circle Teen, the greatest name in pizza-flavored orange drink, brings you another exciting episode of Captain Daybreak. Boys and girls, don't forget to stay tuned after today's exciting program for our special secret decoding message. And now, for our exciting episode today. As our story opens, we find Captain Daybreak in the laboratory of his home in downtown. Let's see what this message says. Captain Daybreak, there is a bomb planted in your laboratory which will go off at 525. Great Scott, that means I only have a little less than three minutes to discover where the bomb is and call the police. Ivan Shark is up to his tricks again. Well, let me use the phone. I'll call the police. I, I know, Joyce. It seems sort of silly to me, too. I can't understand why, but last time I was... Shark. 
Excuse Chuck. me, there's something wrong with the phone here. Hello, Chuck. Hello, hello, this is Chuck. Yes, Chuck, this is Captain Daybreak. Can I use the phone, please? I'm sorry, uh, Captain Daybreak, but I'm on the phone right now. I'll only be about two more minutes. Please give me just Chuck, two minutes might be too late. I just received a note. There's a bomb somewhere in this laboratory. I know, Captain Daybreak. I've heard the show, but that's Don't not Don't be my funny, problem. Chuck. No, there's a time bomb here. It's I going to blow up. Look, i got to get a date you... for the prom Please, tomorrow, get I... off the phone, Chuck. Right, this well, is urgent. Give me another minute. Chuck, one more hang minute. up. Please, I beg of you to hang up that phone. Just one more minute, please. Oh, Chuck. Huh, what am I going to do? Well, maybe I can find it. Let's see, I wonder if it's over. No, it's not over here. I've got to use that phone. Let me just try it again. Something sassafras, Tom. It seems like 40 years since I've been back. Ichabod. Oh, hold Ichabod. on a minute, Tom Mix. I'll be right with you. Hello. Yes, who Ichabod, is it? Ichabod, stop talking to Tom Mix on the phone. I must have the phone immediately. I, I'm sorry, uh, Captain Daybreak, but I'll just be another second. I another second might be too late, Ichabod. Sure. There's Why a... didn't you tell me Captain Daybreak wanted the phone? I didn't realize. Just another second. There's Captain a bomb Daybreak. in this laboratory, Ichabod. I know, I know. I heard the show and also... Not you, too. Tonight. Ichabod, would you hang okay. up the phone, please? Yes, I must call it. the police. Just a few seconds, Captain oh. Daybreak. Oh, what's the use? These people are against me. My friends, supposedly my... Let me try the phone just one more time. I tried to get you a date, Chuck, but I couldn't possibly get you one. Joyce! There is... Joyce! Uh, hello? Hello? Joyce, is Captain Daybreak. This you is You're not going to use that same line about the bomb, are you, on me, Captain no, Daybreak? No, no, Joyce. This is an X-9-235 emergency. Please get off the phone. There's a bomb somewhere in this laboratory, and if a I don't bomb, call the Captain police... Daybreak. in the next... You can have the phone now, Captain Daybreak. Forget it, Joyce. You've just heard another exciting episode of Captain Daybreak, brought to you by Circle Team, the greatest name in pizza-flavored orange drink. And now, boys and girls, here's Captain Daybreak with tonight's secret decoder message. That's right, boys and girls, our secret decoder message for this evening. X-243, Z-235, L-468, Q-231. Hey, Captain Midnight. Yes. What is tonight's secret decoder message? That means this, this is, is the month, month to, to buy, buy a Rambler. Rambler. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, folks. I'm your friendly neighborhood druggist, and I'd like to take this opportunity... Son, would you take your hands off the bubble gum, please, son? I just wanted to see the bubble gum, Mr. Druggist. That's all right. Just keep your hands off. Friends, we are your friendly neighborhood druggist, and it's our opportunity to tell you, son, would you please take your hands off that bubble gum, please? And I just want to, see the, want to see the wrapper on the inside. Just I'll put it right back. I'm not going to chew it. Keep your little hands off of it, will you? So, folks, we'd like to have you stop by, and if at any time we can be of sir, Kid, I told you to take I your hands off that bubble, the gum. bubble gum. Oh! 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 Stop in and see your friendly neighborhood druggist soon, won't you? And now... Once again, the makers of King Kong Birdseed. The greatest name in birdseed. The only birdseed that makes you a parakeet look like an ape. Sounds like a lion and gentle as a bear brings you the heartwarming true to life story of just plain still a bear. Starring Margaret Hockburn to get its stage and screen star in the title role of kind little still a bear. As our story opens, we find Mama Bear and Papa Bear sitting in the living room, apparently having just bought a new kind of dog whistle that's supposed to be high frequency. As we open up, we hear Papa Bear say, I'll tell you, Ma, this is the most hi-fi whistle that's on the market today. This is guaranteed to bring the dog back when he wanders off into the neighbor's yard. I know. We've got the only hi-fi dog in the neighbor, Heathkit. He's been around here for six years. Yeah, it's a wonderful dog. Here it comes when you call him. I think he's... It's a big woofer is what he is, Ma. <laughs> yeah, but he loves the tweeters, too. He's all right. He gets around, that old Heathkit. Well, now, let me show you this whistle, Ma. He's just a little thing, but... Well, now, what a... kind of a whistle is this, Papa it's a Bear? Supersonic high frequency whistle, and nobody oh, can hear it but dogs. Oh, sure. don't give me all that jazz, Papa Bear. Now, what kind of whistle's a supersonic hoople there? Well, what it is, Ma, is when you blow on this whistle, you can't hear it, but it hurts the dog's ears, see, and the dog will come running home, and yet it won't disturb the neighbors. Wait a minute, I'll... You mean to tell me that you've got a whistle that only dogs can hear? That's right. Will we try it out? All right. All right. I, it's kind of silly to blow and not hear nothing. Well, now, just wait a minute. Here we go. I didn't hear a thing, Papa Bear. Quiet as a church mouse. 
Did you call me, Ma? I heard somebody calling me there just a minute ago. Good heavens, Herbert. Papa Bear. Why, well, I think... Get, get the sergeant's flea powder. He's scratching behind his ear. We've uh, got a problem. Yes, we sure do. Herbert, what's the matter with you? I wondered who buried all my soup bones back in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like Herbert Bale get his mouth washed out with Sergeant's police soap tonight. <laughs> the dog show, huh? <laughs> they always are. Why change them now? We've got a good thing going. <laughs> King Kong Birdseed has brought you another two days. It's all over. King Kong Birdseed has brought you another exciting episode of Just Plain Stella Bear. Starring Margaret Hotbird in the title role of kindly old Stella Bear. Based on the book, Not Enough, Soon Enough, by Claudia Klein. Adaptive for radio by Geraldine Fitzgeraldine. This has been a Sherman D. Wolf production. Wow, 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 wow. Now, you mangy beast, good heavens. Winter winds do come and blow. The spring, the flowers do grow. In summertime, here's the girl with three left toes stepping out of her glass booth here. Oh, my goodness sakes. You did it again? I know, I know. They said it couldn't be done. But I did it. You did it. You fell over an L&M pack here, right in the studio. It was wedged in there in the mic cable, I see. Yes. Boy, you are really one clumsy dame. Sounds like a Chinese actress. One clumsy dame. <laughs> oh, boy, is that bad. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, after she stepped out of her glass booth here at Radio Central. Washington's own weather girl, Miss Janitor, with the temperatures, we hope. See the Bow Wow. Look at the Bow Wow wag his tail. See the Bow Wow run. See the Bow Wow chase the kitty. Hey, Wow Bow, I don't want to be the critical the type wow. here, but you refugee from Atlantic Monthly, what are you reviewing now? These are children's books on babysitting on the side this summer. But it must I be uncomfortable. It is. <laughs> and I thought I would rehearse. And if you'd like me to sit with your youngsters, then I'm going to call. I have and no youngsters. Look, well, no, no free plugs on the air. Get, get her. Two, cut her off, Art. Seven. Get at her. Jeez. Let's come on down the street here. we got to hurry and get over to WRC. Otherwise, we're going to... Nice day, isn't it? Hey, look. Hmm? Son of a gun, there's an old weighing machine over there that tells your oh, fortune. Oh, yeah, those things are phony. You yeah, know, just they... for fun. Let's go. I haven't weighed myself in a long Yeah, oh, here. Right. Now hop up on there. Okay. <coughs> okay. Put the money in. Son of a... Look. Hey, that's card. a card. Yeah, let's see what the card says. The card says you weigh 210 pounds, your eyes are brown, and you're going to do a radio. That's amazing. Ah, uh, that could never happen twice. I got a penny here. Try, What's try your again. fate could never happen again. Try, try again. Okay. Yeah, because that thing's a gimmick. Oh, and this is one of those. Hey, another card. Hmm. Card says you still weigh 210 pounds, your eyes are still brown, and you're still going to do a radio show this afternoon. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> this, this is silly. That's Some, the greatest little thing in the world. Somebody knew we were coming. Oh, and they fixed yeah. This somebody thing. fixed I'm sure. sure. Let me try it once more. All right, go yeah, ahead. This is great. Hey, another card. Yeah. Let's see what it says. Because you still weigh 210 pounds, your eyes are still brown, and you just missed the opening of your radio show. Yes! We're watching some flicks in here. Know. We have some movies going on. Now, the reason here. I'm laughing, I just told Arthur to put up a weather jingle, and I realized I don't even have the weather forecast. Figures. Oh, all right. Frank Forrester. He's got all the dope. <laughs> the time, Something personal, Frank. The time at WRC. We got that. It's 20 and a half minutes after the hour of 4 o'clock, and I think I'm ready for a vacation. Wait a minute. Before you go, let me remind you that the radio <laughs> business is one of the most exciting. Quit giggling and laying your eggs up there. Let's lay an egg together. If we're gonna... Radio is one of the biggest... <laughs> Bombs. <laughs> Bombs going in here. Go, bomb it up. Great moments in history. It's time once more for Great Moments in History. The facts and true story behind momentous events that have helped to shape the present day world. And now for today's exciting true story on Great Moments in History. Our scene is Frederick, Maryland, the year 1863. The story behind Barbara Fritchie and her famous stand for the flag of her country. As our scene opens, the Confederate soldiers and their horses are in the street. Hold it, boys. Hold it. Call Miss Fritchie and see if she's up there. All right, Colonel. Miss Fritchie. Miss Barbara Fritchie. Yeah. Right, wait a minute. You jump your line. Miss Fritchie. 
Are you up there in the Fritchie house? Yes, I'm up here making candy. All right, Miss Fritchie. Colonel, I think she's ready. All right. Go ahead and tell her that you wanted to surrender. Oh, is it my time yeah, to tell her? All right, Miss Fritchie. Either you surrender or we'll get a new writer. That don't seem right. Either you surrender, Miss Fritchie, or we must shoot your head. Shoot if you must, this old gray head, but spare the country's flag. Oh, I think she did that rather nicely. Would you take it again from the top, Miss Fritchie? I say, shoot if you must, this old gray head, but spare the country's flag. Colonel, it's your line. All right, hand me the gun. Yes, sir, here it is. Miss Fritchie, are you, are you hurt? I don't think so, but I fell on my bonbons. Never could stand a smart lucky Yankee woman. And that's today's exciting true story on great moments in history, the truth behind Barbara Fritchie and why she fell on her bonbon. I thought that sound right. Barbara Fritchie and why she fell on her bonbon. General Thrills, makers of dip guns and chocolate-covered grasshoppers, presents another exciting episode of The Lone Ranger. Return with us out of those thrilling days of yesteryear, when out on the west come the thundering hoof beats of the great horse Heathcliff. The Lone Ranger rides again. On Heathcliff! Ready, big fellow! We gotta get to Tonto's TV! Nowhere in the pages of history can you find a greater champion of justice. With his faithful Indian companion, Pluto, the masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the Old West. And now, as our story opens, we find the Lone Ranger in Toto's teepee. Apparently, the Lone Ranger, the masked rider of the plains, and his faithful Indian companion are planning some sort of a party. Let's listen as the masked rider says to Toto. Oh, Toto, I feel very restless today. If you don't mind, I think I'll stand up and walk around the teepee for a uh, him. Good man, Kimo Slobby. You walk around TP if you want. That's right, Tonto. I'm so okay. restless today. Ah, uh, mask man, you rip whole side out of wall, TP. I told you before, Tonto, you should get a prefab house and we uh, don't have this problem. Let him, me, good prefab house, yeah. Let me just walk over on this side of the TP. Ah, uh, mask man, I want air conditioning, but this ridiculous. Uh, me uh, send back Sears Ropak, get new canvas. Well, Mask Man, Tonto wants to know something. Yes, Tonto, what do you want to know? You are the lone arranger. You have part-time job uh, this summer, huh? That right, Kimasabi. I'm working evenings at Perpetual. Uh, you are truly a lone arranger. Absolutely, Tonto. Mm -hmm. Now then, Kimasabi, we must discuss the plans for our... Here, have a tom, Tonto. Tonto, <laughs> stomach on bum. <laughs> I think we'd better discuss the plans for our western party, Tonto. Have you got enough? Ah, oh. uh, mask man, you better... <laughs> better sit down. You are wrecking complete teepee. Yes, I'll sit down, Tonto. Uh, I'm rocking the boat here. Uh, okay. Uh. Now then... Oh, now you wreck Indian blanket. Don't sit over there. Here, sit on the next fire. Uh, <laughs> ouch! Oh, Tonto! Oh. Okay. Not on the ashes there, Tonto. Yeah. Now, about party, Mask Man. Yes, what is the list of people that we're going to invite to our party? Me ask you, Mask Man. You oh. have Wyatt Earp? No, Tonto, I don't think I'll invite him. He mm. snubbed me at the last union negotiation. Uh -huh. You invite Bat Masterson? No, he swings that cane too much for me, Tonto. Uh -huh. You have Bert Maverick? No, I don't think I will, Tonto. I lost too much money the last time I gambled with Maverick. You're not going to have Gene Autry in that twang, twang, twang guitar. No, he's too selfish with his chewing gum, Tonto. Wow. <laughs> I see, Mask Man. You top me in that lib again. Well, if you not invite Maverick, if you not invite all big Western stars, who Western star you invite? I am going to invite Annie Oakley, Tonto. It's oh. not that kind of a party. Me I... too, huh? No, I want to be alone, Tonto. Oh. Well, if you don't start using men in the mask, man, you stay alone. Come on, a 
Ranger is a Campbell Trimble Mild Cure Cure, Cure Pete, a Mild, a Chupam, a Tamble Ram, a Shamble Tamble, a Ramble, a Gide, a Gide, a Gide. I guess it's about that time, Edward. All righty. I hate to get up, but it's time to walk down the halls here at NBC and uh, pay our weekly visit to this door here, which is Mark's Experimental Kitchen. A little shoulder behind the door there, Willie. Ah, there we go. I'll help you push it open. Ah. Welcome to Betty Crockett's Experimental Kitchen. you to join Miss Betty Crockett, WRC's home economist, queen of the kitchen range. And here she is, chot chotting around her kitchen. Betty Crockett. Well, Betty, you look you tripped there. I'm sorry to help you up there, Betty. Help an old lady up. Hello, lady. Betty, can I have some of that bagel? I Ow. get your hands off my bagel fat. I'm sorry. As soon as I can't stand the grabby engineer. Don't touch me if you don't love me. Uh, Betty, are you going to uh, kiss the groom? Willard is a newlywed now, you know. I don't want to kiss no broom. No, groom. The groom? Yes, the groom. Oh, Willard. Yeah, give, give him a kiss. Give me. Please, Betty, come I, on, I don't think that. Yeah, yeah, come yeah. on now, Willard. Yeah, <laughs> Betty, I... <laughs> See you now, Scarlett. <laughs> Betty, you... That's enough. Oh, that's enough. Right. Now, give me uh, back my bubble gum, will you, I buddy? thought, <laughs> I thought possibly you might have a experiment over here. Good recipe for uh, this afternoon because. Uh, yes, well, hello, Eddie. I do. Hi, well. Betty. How, How are, you? are you? I thought maybe something. Willard and Mary have a lovely house, and they cook out a lot. I thought maybe you might have something for uh, Mary's uh, new recipe book that she's starting. Well, if uh, she wants one, I'll be glad to send her a copy of old Betty's. Uh, no, I thought maybe you could give one on the radio for no. the. No. Uh, all right. Sure. All right. Today's recipe, girls and Mary. I mean, Mary is a girl. Of Sure, Mary's a grand old night. Yeah. Oh, you're poetic old yes. thing. <laughs> you laugh at... Oh, sir, if you oh, get oh, your hands... I just was looking for some of that bubblegum pie over there. Oh, oh. You're getting all sticky around there. Girls, today I thought you might like something for a cookout that might be interesting and delightful. It's called asbestos hamburgers. Asbestos hamburgers? Asbestos hamburgers. Oh, would you elaborate on that just a little bit, please? I would if I knew what elaborate meant. Uh, if, well, uh, tell us more about it. Oh, well, why didn't you say that? Well, so? I was trying Smart to... Smart, I college punk. No, I'm just... All right, hey, I'll do her. Well, girls, you know how it is when you get your cookouts going good and you get your hamburgers on the charcoal grill and about every other time somebody burns their little fingers, oh, yes. don't you know? Yes, or the meat scorches or something Yes, it like does. Mm -hmm. And so what you do, girls, is just wrap up your hamburgers in a little sheet of asbestos and put them on the grill. And then when they come off, you don't burn your fingers, don't you know? Uh, that uh, only has a couple of fallacies, Betty. Uh, I don't know. You can't very well eat the asbestos, can you? And the hamburger. Sure, you can. You, you can. dip in the asbestos, first of all, in the special sauce. And your special sauce? Mm hmm. What is that? Bacon and boulder on beef sauce. That sounds delightful. Uh, that takes away the bite. I'll bet it does. It takes yeah. away the whole thing, Betty. In fact, you got to watch where you're. You would eating. recommend this for a cookout, would you? Heavens, no. Oh, not uh, even to my worst enemy. Well, I'll see you, you later. That. Thank you very much, Betty. You've been so visiting long until tomorrow. with Miss Betty Crockett, WRC's home economist from WRC's Experimental Kitchen. We'll be back with you next Tuesday. And once again, it's time for Miss Betty Crockett. So long for now. So long for now. Can I just have one piece? Arthur, I've oh, told you oh, time and time again. Well, let's close the door and get out of here.